Hey everybody, and Tony here with my review of Borjak's Rosalka with conductor Erina Yashima in the first half of the opera and Christoph Bretla in the second half of the opera, which I saw at the Komische Oper Berlin. This marks the second time I saw Borjak's Rosalka at the Komische Oper Berlin with this particular opera being directed by Barry Kosky ever since I first saw it nearly six years and four months ago because I wanted to see and hear Kim Lillian Strebel in the title role. I have been following Kim Lillian Strebel's career for quite some time. I first knew about her in a lot of the subretish roles, such as The Shepherd Boy from Wagner's Tannhäuser. Eventually, she built herself up in a lot of the lyric coloratura and light lyric soprano roles such as Pamina and the First Lady from Die Zauberflöte, Susanna from Le Nozze di Figaro, Fior di Ligi from Cosi Fan Tutte, Michaela from Carmen, and Cendrillon from Massenet's Cendrillon. However, these days, she seems to be adding heavier roles to her repertoire, including Helm Wiege from Wagner's Die Valkyrie, and both Gutruna and the Third Norn from Goethe Demerung. I was initially skeptical in terms of seeing her as Rusalka because I mainly associate Mistrebel in a lot of these light lyric soprano roles and not roles such as Rusalka which require a spinto, let alone a full lyric soprano, singing this role, especially when it comes to singing those chest tones that are necessary for Rusalka's Hymn to the Moon, Miesich Guna Nebi Hlubokem. After listening to Mistrebel as Rusalka, she was who I expected her to be, a light lyric soprano singing a spinto soprano role. But that was not a bad thing. Yes, her voice was rather light, for a role that is otherwise designated for either a spinto soprano or a full lyric soprano. However, I still have to give her credit for what she was able to deliver in terms of theatricality, throwing herself in this role with full abandon and even full commitment to both her voice in terms of letting it ring throughout the theater, as well as what she was able to inject with this role. She was also such a trooper on stage because interpreting Barry Kosky's version of Rusalka was certainly not an easy feat. She's on stage nearly all the time. The fact that Mistrebel was able to pull it off with abandon was absolutely laudable. Furthermore, she was able to show gutsiness and gusto throughout her high notes, whether she throws high A's, high B flats, B's, high C's, and even a high D, she let it out with full abandon and with nothing holding her back whatsoever. However, there were some issues that I had with her voice. As I stated before, she was relatively light for the role of Rusalka. There were times that I also felt like her chest tones were very hollow and were not as rich and full in the more serious moments, which unfortunately caused her high notes, although they had that ring and that sheen, to sound strident and rather shrill on certain occasions. However, that is not to deprive Mistrebel of what she was able to accomplish. She was able to be a major trooper throughout the opera. She threw herself in with abandon. She was a thoroughly committed performer, and despite whatever vocal issues she had, such as her chest stones being hollow and her voice not being one that I would associate for Rusalka, she was still able to give the goods. I also hope that Mish Trebel continues to remain wise with her choice of repertoire and does not become easily tempted with the heavier roles because what I hear 
in Kim Lillian Strebo's voice is that she is far more suitable to roles such as Antonia from Le Comte of Man, Lucia di Lammermoor, Violetta from La Traviata, Ilia from Idomeneo, Mignon from Amboise Thomas Mignon, Melisande from Peleas et Melisande, Blanche de la Force from Le Dialogue de Carmelite, Louise from Gustave Charpentier's Louise, Glauche from Cherubini's Medea, Amina from Bellini's La Sonambula, and Elvira Valton from Bellini's I Puritani. Those are roles I would consider to be much more suitable for Mistrebel's voice because they can show off the brilliance of what she has to offer, especially in those high notes. And these are roles that I feel are far more tailor-made for her silvery tone. At the end of the day, Kim Lillian Strebel was nonetheless committed as a performer and as a singer in terms of what she was able to do as Rusalka. And while it's not a voice I would easily associate, let alone root for, in terms of this iconic water nymph, I still have to give my hat off to Miss Trebel for a job well done. And here's also hoping that she will continue to deliver strong performances and keep on developing her technique in the right way. Carolina Gumosh definitely stole the show as the foreign princess. I have seen her career grow from strength to strength. First learning about her when she sang Giulietta from Le Comte of Man, and actually seeing her live as Smeraldine from Prokofiev's The Love for Three Oranges, and even Olga from Evgeny Onegin, and Le Pont Charmant from Massenet's Centrion. And seeing and hearing Carolina Gomos as the foreign princess was quite the treat. She did have sufficient sultriness to not only her voice, but also the way she was able to move around the stage and take full advantage of her physical stage presence. She was able to use that long and elegant figure of hers to make the foreign princess a formidable force, thus combining lethal beauty and icy calculation to make the foreign princess come to life as a character. And in terms of Carolina Gumosh's voice, she does have a pliable mezzo-soprano voice that might end up going more in the direction of a Falcon soprano. In fact, I definitely see a future for Carolina Gumos in more Falcon soprano roles. Yes, she may continue singing Octavian from De Rosen Cavalier and the composer from Ariadne of Naxos, but I would Definitely love to hear her in roles such as Zeglinde from Die Valkyrie, Brangene from Tristan und Isolde, Adriano from Rienzi, Kundri from Parsifal, Valentine de Saint-Prix from Les Huguenots, Venus from Tannhäuser, Eboli from Don Carlo, Tigrana from Edgar, Cassandre from Le Troyon, Anita from La Navarrez, and even Adalgisa from Norma. I personally do not see her in roles such as Amneres, Azucena, or even La Principessa di Bouillon because those roles require a whole lot of heft and chest. And even though I did like the timbre of Carolina Gumosha's voice, there were times that I felt that she could have used a whole lot more metal and sheen to make her voice truly bloom. Because who I have in my ears are true dramatic sopranos who embodied the foreign princess, and those include Ludmila Vorakova and even Eva Randova, even though she herself was also a high dramatic mezzo-soprano. Voices such as Vorakova and Randova were far more developed and actually had chiaroscuro. 
Nevertheless, I still have to give kudos to Carolina Gumos for a job superbly done as the foreign princess as I thought she was able to steal the show in terms of the main cast. And here's also hoping that she continues to exercise her technique a lot more and make sure that it continues to shine and develop in the right direction. I was anticipating Nora Surozian singing the role of Jeji Baba because I've read a whole lot about her and she seems to specialize in roles such as Amneres, Atsuchena, Carmen, Dalila, Eboli, and basically the standard roles for the mezzo-soprano repertoire. And while I did like how she was able to incorporate Yeji Baba's combination of scary school marm with Dr. Frankenstein, and while I did like how Madame Surozian's stage presence was strong and commanding, her voice left a lot to be desired. First of all, while I did like how she was able to attack the high notes, and while there is that potential for her timbre to show some steadiness, her tone was unsteady, wobbly, woofy, and all over the place to the point of inconsistency. There were several occasions where her chest tones were hollow, where her chest tones showed problems in the much deeper registers. Because who I have in my ears when it comes to Yeshibaba like mezzo-sopranos complete with deep, dark, round, and rich chest tones were Oraya Dominguez, Irina Arkipova, Elena Obrazova, and Vera Sokupova, just to name a few. Heck, there was even Elena Nikolai, Ebestignani, and Giuseppina Cinetti. Those were mezzo-sopranos with extremely strong chest tones, steady and sturdy techniques, and rock-solid vocal qualities that made them absolutely accessible, let alone excellent, not really in Yejibaba, but other roles such as Azucena, Ulrika, and even to some extent La Principessa from Suor Angelica. Nora Surusion as Yejibaba, when it came to her voice, was quite disappointing, which is really sad because Nora Surusian actually has great material to work with. She has established herself singing these dramatic mezzo roles for years, and based on what I heard from her live, while she did have a strong stage presence, her voice could have used a lot more improvement. I would have loved for her to go and be fully committed to those chest tones and really dig deep into them, just like the great mezzo-sopranos of the past. And I really do hope that she does commit to really improving on her chest tones, because as I stated before, she's got wonderful material to work with. She's been well known doing these demanding mezzo slash contralto roles. But unless she doesn't develop her technique, let alone those chest tones, the best way she can, her career may not end up moving forward. And here's also hoping that she does take advantage of those chest tones because there are occasions where the lower part of her voice was kind of inaudible and there were occasions where although she had sufficient emotional investment as Yejibaba, it did not really reflect on her voice, which was supposed to be imposing, booming, and strong. All I heard was that it was inconsistent, woofy, and left a lot to be desired. So here is hoping that Nora Surozian will commit to further developing her chest tones and really, really strengthening them so that her career will last for a long time instead of being cut short. 
singing the prince was Sung Min Song, who I first heard and saw as Arnold from Rossini's Guillaume Pell. And while I thought he was good in that role, although not really one of the best interpreters of that role, I thought he was quite decent as the prince. He was able to take advantage of his lyric tenor instrument and use his voice to such a beautiful effect. And he was able to bring in sufficient impetuousness, passion, stubbornness, and hot-headedness to the prince. However, there were occasions where his high notes thinned out and every time he reached for those high notes, it felt like his voice was disappearing. The same thing can be said about his chest tones. Even if he tries to sing those chest tones, he was inaudible in the lower register. I thought he was at his most beautiful when he had his middle and some of the high notes that he sang. Although the high D flat that he sang near the end of the opera was a bit on the faint side. This is because who I have in my ears, and to quote best opera moments, is a sword-like spinto tenor voice. The type of voice that is incisive and ringing not only throughout his middle, but also the high notes and the chest tones. Voices like Franco Corelli, Mario Filippeschi, and even one of the most famous interpreters of the prince, Beno Blahut, and even Vislav Ochman come to mind. These were tenors who had ringing tones to their voices and who were very well known in a lot of these heroic roles. That's not to say that Sung Min Song was a bad singer. Far from it. He was good, but there were some reservations that I had with how he produced his voice. Just like what I thought about Kim Lillian Strebel as Rusalka, I thought he was a tad bit light for the role of the prince, who I would really love for this role to be sung by either a spinto tenor or a dramatic tenor, let alone a great full lyric tenor with an awesomely rock steady technique. And while Sung Min Song did his job the best that he could, there were definitely some things that he needed to improve on. First of all, he really needs to work on those chest tones because there were occasions where he sounded unsupported. Secondly, there were occasions where his high notes thinned out. And I'm pretty sure that once he strengthens his voice to the best of his abilities, as well as choose his roles wisely and not be overly tempted by a lot of these heavier roles, his career can last for a very long time. After all, Sung Min Song has a really good voice with equally good material. I just pray that he will remain wise with his choice of roles and not give in to temptation because that is the last thing I would ever want him to do. The material is there. His lyric tenor voice is naturally beautiful. All he needs to do is keep on improving on his technique and really remain wise with his choice of repertoire. Thiel Favaitz was wonderfully steady as Vodnik, the water gnome. However, there were reservations I had with him in terms of how he sang the more intense and emotionally charged moments. While I really loved the steadiness and the sturdiness of his basso cantante voice, those came with the reservations of him being frigid, monochromatic, and absolutely colorless when he tries to sing the more emotionally charged moments. I could blame Barry Kosky for how he directed Tilfa Weitz in terms of his vision of Vodnik because there were several, several occasions where I felt like despite Tilfa Weitz trying to really let his voice carry through the orchestra in the more emotionally charged moments, I felt like his wings were being clipped 
probably because of how he was directed or it might have been an off night for him. Because who I have in my ears in terms of one of the most superb interpreters of Vodnik, the water gnome, is Evgeny Nesterenko. His squilo, his emotional abandon when he throws himself into this fatherly role, and the strong technical prowess that he was able to give off were absolutely unparalleled. Although Tjulfa Weitz was not a bad singer, I felt like his wings were being clipped from being more emotionally charged, let alone fully taking advantage of his naturally wonderful and naturally steady basso cantante voice. I'm sure that in better hands, he would have really let it rip. But as it was, it was serviceable at best. He still did a fine job, especially in the more pensive and quieter moments, let alone the reflective moments of his solo number. But in those moments where he curses Rusalka and has to be emotionally charged, such as when he tells her, woe betide you, that you'll never end up being reunited with the water nymphs, I felt like something was missing, which is an absolute shame because Mr. Favites has wonderful material to work with. This is a gentleman I would also love to see in grander roles such as Philip II from Don Carlo. And I'm sure that how he was directed also affected the way that he sang. Because although he could have had a lot to give, there was just something that was constantly holding him back, which is a big shame. So here's hoping that directors will be able to bring out the best in Tilfavite's voice so that he can really spread his wings with abandon. The smaller roles were superbly sung, even much better than the main singers. Nikita Voronchenko's Huntsman was virile and absolutely beautifully sung, and here's hoping that his future will be bright in the lyric baritone repertoire. Johannes Duntz was a technically secure cook thanks to his sturdy lyric tenor voice which can be characterful but he also took great advantage of those chest tones and he was able to make his tone steady well focused and with no signs of wobbling whatsoever. Mirka Wagner shone like the brightest stars as the kitchen maid all thanks to her light lyric soprano voice. And she was able to make her voice float so beautifully and so elegantly that I could not help but feel elated every time she opened her mouth to sing those gorgeous tones as if though they were pearls coming out from her mouth. And just as laudable were the three nymphs sung by Josefina Mindus, Carmen Artaza, and Elisabeth Vrede, who were able to use Borjak's music to the greatest of their abilities and made their voices blend with beautiful harmony, especially when it came to combining Josefina Mindus's lovely light lyric soprano voice and both Carmen Artaza's and Elisabeth Vrede's sturdy mezzo-soprano voices, which have a lot of potential to grow. In fact, I would even argue that Josefina Mindus, Carmen Artaza, and Elisabeth Vrede have beautiful futures ahead of them, and here's also hoping that they will continue to stay as strong as ever as performers, and here's also hoping that their future will be as bright as ever. I also have to give my hat off to Marcus Wagner, who played the Igor-like role of Yezhbaba's son. And this was also thanks to how he was able to make this madman come to life with his cackles, screams, and wails. Overall, while there were issues I had with some of the singers, I still have to give some credit where credit is due especially when it came to Kim Lillian and Sung Min Song carrying the show, and even 
with Carolina Gomosh stealing said show thanks to the potential she continues to show as a fine singing actress. While I thought that Nora Sorosian and Tilfa Weitz need some improvement in the way they produce their voices, there's still potential for them to grow. However, when all is said and done, the singers of the smaller roles ranging from Nikita Voronchenko all the way up to the likes of Josefina Mindos, Carmen Artafa, and Elizabeth Breda, as well as Mirka Wagner stealing the show, were all straight-A efforts all around. Nevertheless, each and every performer was able to give it their all, and they were able to show some commitment to their craft as performers, although some technical prowess does need to be improved on when it comes to their overall vocal quality. In the first half of Rusalka, Erina Yashima did a superb job in keeping the orchestra and chorus together, and there was no doubt that she did make sure that the singers and the orchestra saw eye to eye. It was unfortunately announced that Miss Yashima was infected with COVID-19 and had to be rushed to hospital. Nevertheless, the second half of the opera was taken over by her colleague, Christoph Bretla, who was able to carry the show all throughout the second half of Rusalka. And he definitely gave it his all when it came to keeping the orchestra, the chorus, and the singers working in synchronicity, as well as ensuring an enjoyable time for all all of us listeners to revel in. With some few reservations I had with some of the singers, and although there were times I felt like the singing could have been better, I still have to give loads of kudos to Kim Lillian Strebel, Carolina Gumos, Nora Surusian, Sung Min Song, and Til Favaitz in the lead roles for at least doing serviceable jobs in what they were able to do in Barry Kosky's production of Vorjak's Rosalka. At the opposite end of the scale, I thought that the singing from the smaller roles was an absolute treat to listen to, and here's also hoping that a great number of the young singers in those smaller roles will continue to shine as singers and develop in the right way. Furthermore, I wish Maestra Irina Yashima good health, and I hope she gets well soon. And I also have to give major kudos to Maestro Christoph Bretla for continuing to carry the evening on. And for those of you who caught Borjak's Rusalka at the Komische Oper Berlin, what do you think of it? Did you feel that Kim Lillian Strebel was suitable in the role of Rusalka? And did you really like her singing? Was there something about the singing that you thought was particularly good? Or did you feel like there was something that was not particularly to your liking when it came to the overall quality of the singers? Please comment below and let me know. Well, that's it for my review of Borjak's Rusalka at the Komische Oper Berlin, starring Kim Lillian Strebel as Rusalka. And tune in tomorrow for my review of Verdi's La Traviata at the Deutsche Oper Berlin, starring Mané Golayan as Violetta Valéry. So until then, good night everybody.